teaching this a bit. Well, again, friends, I am Andy C. Luter, and I'm co-hosting this event with Dr. Dennis Goffin. This is a mini webinar entitled, Where Did All of These Churches Come From? A profound, insightful understanding of Christian denominations. We had a rather robust conversation on last evening, covered a great deal of material, not quite as much material as we had anticipated and scheduled to cover, but uh, we are resolute this evening about doing so tonight and so we're delighted that you're here happy that you're here and um it is already after eight o'clock and so i'm going to yield and invite my co-host to say good evening to you and then we're going to return to our uh, subject matter uh, thank you dr luna what we, we we did um um i think everything that we covered last night needed to be covered so I'm not uh, upset at the fact that we didn't get to maybe all of the slides we wanted to get through because I think uh, the material that we covered was necessary. Uh, again, there is a two-part course. We took our time to go through a whole denominational setup. And what we're doing is just whetting your appetite for this. There's a course that you'll have plenty of time to get into and get involved. We kind of answer some questions during this webinar that we really don't answer in the course, the course does more in-depth into the studies that we're in. We're sort of kind of wetting your appetite for the course, uh, which will include a certificate for both parts one and part two. The link that we put out on the um, in the chat is a link that will give you a, a tremendous discount for both. Each course sells on the on our website itself at $99 each. If you buy them as a bungle, you can save and get it for $150. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, let me uh, start us off with prayer, and then I'm going to turn it over to my co-host so we can get started with the webinar. Father, we thank you tonight for your blessings. We thank you for those who are participating with us tonight, we pray that something will be said, something will be seen as we present these slides that will help them and give them clarity on the things that they're interested in. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, very, very quickly, and let me just kind of go over some of the things that uh, we talked about last night in terms of how we have set this up. And uh, we are using what is called the Socratic method. This is an ancient teaching tool that uh, raises questions and then the responses to the question is what's designed to deliver the content of the information. And so uh, certainly that term, I'm sure you recognize as a part of Socrates, this particular teaching method was popularized by Socrates, which is why it is referred to as the Socratic method. Uh, Dr. Goffin and I, I'm not surrendering who we are. I know that many of you are accustomed to seeing us in a cleric capacity, but we've chosen to uh, dress down to be a little more casual. That's why we're in polo shirts tonight as opposed to our civic attire. And uh, that's why we refer to each other as doctor as opposed to bishop and archbishop. We wanted this to be an academic setting, a scholastic uh, conversation. And so because we wear multiple hats, we're choosing to wear a more academic hat than a vocational hat. So let me just very, very quickly. Last night, we talked about what is a denomination and we, and we pointed out the inclusion of those groups that may not particularly uh, be associated with denominations. Archbishop, is there anything you wanna say in review regarding that? Um, really, we just wanted to make mention that all of these uh, denominations are things that we're going to talk about in Christianity. And we're not just talking about Protestant denominations. I think I want to mention that point. We're talking about Christian denominations. So last night, we talked about uh, Catholic and Orthodox in terms of denominational viewpoint. And then we talked about liturgical churches and non-liturgical churches. Now, the, this, the, the pair of terms, liturgical, non-liturgical, high church, low church, formal worship, free worship, all of those are interchangeable and synonymous. And as you can see from the list here on the screen, the liturgical churches uh, tend to be a little more structured and the non-liturgical churches tend to be a little more freewheeling, so to speak. I wanna say, um, Dr. Luther here, that um, the course itself is divided up in these two categories. 
The first part does deal with liturgical churches, and we take time with these six liturgical churches that we have here in the course to identify and walk through this whole idea of liturgical churches. The second part of the course deals with non-liturgical churches, and we divide it into six categories. So we've got six on one side, six on the other. So the um, the course on denominations deals with dividing up in these two parts. Part one would deal with liturgical uh, churches, and part two would deal with non-liturgical churches. All will bring us into this whole idea of what denominations are and how they got about to be. We're going to talk about some of those things tonight. And then, uh, so here's where we're beginning to like liturgical versus contemporary services. And let me explain to you why I think that this is extremely relevant, friends, is because as a result of the pandemic, COVID-19, the coronavirus, all of us have been forced to reinterpret and to some extent to reinvent ourselves. And so many of us who were tied to a very traditional, uh, standardized form of worship because we had to do things virtually without the, the without the accompaniments that we were normally accustomed to, we had to reinvent ourselves. And so that has raised the question as to the contrasting differences between liturgical and contemporary. So here's the question, should, hist should historic liturgy be a part of the weekly worship service? Are contemporary services more effective in welcoming and reaching unbelievers. As we rethink what the very definition of worship is, we're caught in the crux between trying to be what people are accustomed to be and then trying to be what is effective because not all of what we have traditionally done works in a virtual environment. Uh, you know, high volume, animated, emotional worship, uh, high energy, can come across as buffoonery within the intimacy of uh, virtual services, a TV camera, video camera, a computer screen. So all of us are struggling. How do we, re how do we redefine ourselves, continue to be authentic, but also be effective? Doctor? I think um, <coughs> Dr. Peter, you have summed up really the issue of where we are with all of this. Uh, we're at the crossroads. Uh, I think it was probably back in 2010, 2011, we started dealing with trying to have a menu for churches. There were churches that were offering uh, historical, traditional services, contemporary services, and modern services all at the same location. So they were trying to be all things for all people. I believe, and this is just my viewpoint, that we may be taking the wrong turn here and trying to find out what people want rather than to find out what God wants. And I think that we may be stuck in between uh, the difference between worship and entertainment. And uh, I think that's um, that may be what we have to look at in terms of marketing. Is this something that we feel that we'd be more effective to do or not effective to do? And where does God fit in all of this? Is this something that still glorifies God or just entertains the flesh? And I think those are the questions that we constantly ask ourselves as we struggle with this idea of liturgical and contemporary service. Is there, is there something in tradition or something we should take out of tradition? Uh, what parts are biblical? What parts are not? Um, why are we looking at it? Because of the change in environment that we find ourselves in all the time. Things are changing every day around us. Through this pandemic, we've had to change our emphasis on worship and the things that we've done. So it's, it's brought about a tremendous change for us. Bishop? Indeed. You know, I saw a posting not too terribly long ago that said, God calls for us to have an altar in church, not a stage. And that seemingly <laughs> uh, was a bit of a poke at some of the contemporary approaches to church. Yeah. I was also listening to a sermon by G.E. Patterson earlier today, <clears throat> and he was talking about the fact that the early church, even the early Pentecostal church, did not have the elevated pulpit that is so standardized today, and that the gap between the pulpit and the pew did not always exist, especially in the early churches. So this whole idea of reinventing ourselves and changing in response to cultural mores has been something that has been going on since the beginning of the church age. 
That's true, because under the, after the Protestant Reformation, we had a re-emphasis. Worship prior to the Protestant Reformation evolved around the table. Everything was about the uh, communion table, the, the Lord's Supper. After the Reformation period and discovery of, of the Bible in our languages, we started elevating the pulpit and lowering the table so that the church service evolved around preaching and sermons as opposed to the table. So uh, for 1,500 years, worship evolved around the table. And now for the last five, six, seven hundred years, it's revolved around the stage or the pulpit. Ah, so friends, what is the difference between a church and a denomination? And we're going to come at this from multiple approaches because my sense is that some of the terminology and some of the vocabulary that we use, we use interchangeably while technically and literally it is quite different, quite separate. And those things that we call church in a very technical sense, in a very literal sense, are uh, are not necessarily churches. And I'll allow Dr. Goffin to expand upon this, but let me just establish at this point that technically and literally, there are only four churches in the world. And let me say that again. Technically, not practically, but technically, there are only four churches in the world. That would be the Greek Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the Protestant Church, and then the Coptic or the African Church. Orthodox Church. Now, within the Protestant Church, we have a number of different denominations, but there is really only four churches. However, we have uh, conditioned ourselves to refer to our local congregations as churches. Hollywood Baptist Church, Hillside Baptist Church, First Baptist Church. And so on the one side, we have substituted congregations. We have substituted the word church when we really intend and we really mean congregation or parish. But then on the other side, especially when it comes to Baptist ecclesiology, Baptist ecclesiology argues that every individual church is the equivalent of a self-standing church. So Hollywood Baptist Church is the ecclesial, is the ecclesiastic equivalent of the Roman Catholic church because every church is sovereign and independent. Now, that cannot be applied throughout all of Christianity, but it is applied in a technical sense in this particular vein. Doctor? Uh, <coughs> Mr. Lula, you covered a lot of ground there, and let me just reiterate and, and agree with my colleague that we have really uh, misused the term church and denomination. Most people really don't understand what a denomination is, but we pointed out three things last night that were important to this denominational viewpoint. That is doctrine, worship, and Christian living. These things are important. So denomination is a collection of congregations or parishes that all believe in the same things. They all worship the same way. They all have the same um, viewpoint, the uh, government structure. So when we talk about the doctrine, the worship, and the polity that is in the church, all of these represent churches who believe all of those same things are called a denomination. So they are involved. And so a church then really sits within the denomination, or in a broader sense, as Dr. Lulu was mentioning, there are only four types of churches. And so even though we talk about all these churches, what we do then is then put our labels on the church. And generally, our church names really kind of define what our doctrinal position are. You know, for instance, Baptist Church, Pentecostal Church, AME Church, Methodist Church. We, and it might have a name in front, but uh, we always know what that church is because we get the denomination affiliation until we get to the churches who do not. So sometimes there's a difference between a denominational church, which means really a church under government. That's what a denomination technically means. Let's talk about that it means those type of churches have a polity, they have a government. And so their orthopraxy is all tied into a unified order of government and of worship that they all do, no matter what, uh, where you are in the world, 
a Baptist church is a Baptist church. No matter where you are in the world, whatever that denominational church is, you'll find the same structure throughout. So that makes that church what it is, where an independent church, and we'll talk about that in a minute, is, is a little bit different. They see themselves complete without connecting to anything else. Bishop? Brother, yeah, Brother uh, Long raises the question as to whether or not the Coptic church can be considered a part of the Eastern Orthodox church. And I think that the response there, Brother Long, uh, is that both the Eastern Orthodox church and the Coptic church subscribe to the theology and the general doctrines of the same thing. However, we view them, or at least I do, as two separate church entities. Why? Because the Greek Orthodox Church went east. They're part of the Eastern Empire. Whereas the Coptic Church, which was the African Orthodox Church, was in the West. So even though they had similar practices and similar beliefs, their geography and their ethnocentricity, how they referred to themselves in terms of their racial and ethnic identification. One called themselves Greek. Greek Orthodox. The others were the Coptic Church or the African Orthodox. And so even though they both had a subscription to Orthodox beliefs, they had a, a different ethnicity and racial identification. Doctor? Let me, let me point out too, Bishop, you're exactly right. The uh, Greek Orthodox Church went more to the East and the Coptic Church, where the term Coptic is really a combination of Greek and Egyptian. So when you put those terms together and uh, we have this Coptic terms, it starts to go west and south of, of where we are, closer down to Africa. And so we get a whole different viewpoint. It is a different kind of church. A lot of the theological positions of the church in the early councils and uh, establishing the church came out of North Africa. And some many of those uh, um, early church fathers were out of the um, Coptic Orthodox Church as opposed to the Greek Orthodox Church, and as opposed to the church in the West, which later became the Latin Church, and then more specifically by the 12th century, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, many of us don't know, we mentioned last night, that the Roman Catholic Church as a denomination really doesn't start until the 11th or 12th century, although they will argue that they go all the way back to the first century. Because at that point, the first two, three centuries of the church, that's when the church was all one. And it was considered, according to the creeds, to be Catholic, which means from the Latin term that it was a universal church. So we see this sort of thing. And so here we, we're talking about now churches who are under denomination have a same doctrinal viewpoint, have a same worship style, and has the same uh, governmental sort of uh, operation of the way they do. They operate with their uh, code of ethics, their book of commons, their particular uh, discipline book that uh, refers to how they should handle things within their polity of government throughout the world. Uh, Bishop, our question now is what is the non-denominational non church? What is a non-denominational church? And that has, that, that has gained popularity, especially here of late. Now, when we get to the course, one of the things that we talk about in the course is uh, Adventism, holiness, post-millennialism, and uh, there was a fourth, uh, oh, the restorative movement. And the, right. what, what characterizes reformations over the years is this desire to get back to what was the mm -hmm. original structure of the church. And part of the approach of the non-denominational church is to remove the bureaucracy, to move the hierarchy, and to try and get back to the early or the ancient church where denominational labels had not yet surfaced. Doctor? And why, of course, not just where the denominational church left certainly, but also to get away from uh, the authority. Uh, because those in non-denominational churches will claim that the structures that we have now was not the structure of the early church. Let me let me rest there for a minute. There was no structure of the early church in the first two or three centuries. It was a outlaw society. They were running for their life. 
Uh, they were only called disciples, later being called Christians, and they just wanted to, the eschatological viewpoint of the church in it is just to wait till Jesus comes. They were trying to get groups together, get everyone out of the world they could to become Christians and be prepared for the parosa of Jesus when he came. So it was a whole different viewpoint. There was no government. There was nothing set up. We don't get that structure of what we call maybe an institutional structure as long after the apostles are gone and long after we begin to start canonizing the scripture close to the fourth century. So then we start looking at institutional church because the church is now uh, structured and starts to move into society where for the next, well, I, I guess, four or five centuries, the church then really finds itself integrated in society and basically under a term that called Christendom, ran society for a while. So most of these non-denominational churches are really kind of saying, we don't have any government. We don't have any uniform government. We, we are single. We do our own doctrine, our own worship, our own polity. And so we don't answer to any hierarchy and nothing like that is in place. What we can see as early as the second century, many of the church fathers and in their writings had advocated that bishops would be over the assemblies that were growing up, the congregations or the groups that were growing up. So the advocacy of bishops came in well early in the second century. And from then on, it was this movement of bishops because the apostles had died off in the first century. Those who came alive after those apostles the, uh, that was carrying on after them and getting things were not going off in the miracles, signs, and wonders that the apostles, they had the teaching, but they did not have the sign gifts. So the sign gifts were missing. So these men were referred to as teachers. They were, and then the teachers then referred to those who were coming out leading the church as bishops, because that was a terminology that was picked up from the early apostles. That they were uh, they would make primarily Pauline uh, language that that got used to establish bishops, even though the early Catholic Church does not recognize Paul as a bishop. And let me uh, add. I add this, when you get into the course, the course that we're recommending to you and the course that we're hopeful that so many of you will not only just take a look at and review, but will register and become a part of uh, some of the names that we're going to introduce to you in the era between the Second Great Awakening and the advent of the holiness movement would be names mm -hmm. like Thomas Campbell, names like Alexander mm -hmm. Campbell, names like uh, Barton Stone. Uh, these were individuals who set out to create a non-denominational or an interdenominational kind of structure. What we find very, very interesting is that even those movements that begin with no reference, no tie, no attachment to structure and or authority become bureaucratic and end up becoming institutionalized uh, denominations in and of themselves, even though they label themselves and they describe themselves as non-denominational or interdenominational vis-a-vis -vis the Disciples of Christ or the United Church of Christ uh, or the Brethren. All of those right. actually began as the, with the intent of being non-denominational, but as time went on, ended up becoming institutionalized. And one of the features of becoming institutionalized is to take on the character of a denomination. I quickly want to insert this, that what Dr. Goffin has referred to in terms of the reason the early church did not seek to be structured or institutionalized is because they anticipated an almost immediate return of Jesus. As time went on and it became evident that Jesus was not going to come when they thought he was going to come, it became necessary to now adopt structure so that whenever Jesus returned, there would be a church for him to return to. Absolutely. Ah. <laughs> so when a church, make sure, uh, when a church is non-denominational, does that mean it has no need of other churches is it so independent watch this is it so independent is it so sovereign is it so exclusive unto itself that it cuts off its need its reliance and its dependence upon 
of the church. And while that may appear on the surface to be the case, let me point to my own tradition, which is the Baptist tradition. And within the Baptist tradition, we have this item that's called the Baptist cooperative movement, which means that even though we started from the bottom and moved up, uh, the early on Baptist churches recognized the need not only for fellowship, but the need for interdependence upon one another. Because part of the conclusion that, that they came to was that there were some things that they could do together more effectively by pooling their resources than they could do by themselves. An example, educational facilities uh, coming out of the Civil War. There was a great need to educate the masses of Black people in this country. Well, the Baptist cooperative movement, which was defined as having a district association, a state convention, a national convention, uh, they discovered that there were some things like education and foreign mission or even home mission that they could do more effectively by being connected to one another as opposed to trying to do everything on their own. Doctor? Um, we have a question. Uh... Bishop in our Q and A that says, "What was it, what is the difference between interdenominational churches and non-denominational churches?" Excellent question. Again, we're 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 playing semantics with words here. People use this term interdenominational to kind of conclude that they got a piece of mostly all of the denominations, and they uh, wrapped all of their doctrinal viewpoint together between different denominations. Again, what we're talking about, most people consider when they're talking about denominations is being under a government, uh, being controlled by a uh, council of churches or it, more importantly, a bishop. So most of these churches consider themselves when they're non-denominational or interdenominational. Now here we have a need for other churches most interdenominational churches consider themselves partnering with churches like them who are not under a denominational viewpoint. So they consider themselves interdenominational. And non-denominational, of course, they, they don't deal with the bureaucracy of, of high uh, government and standards that would be from the denominational viewpoint. So they call themselves um, interdenominational or denominational, same kind of terms. The idea is a slap in the face to say, we are not like them. And so they, they separate themselves. And some really don't see a need to be associated with other churches. A lot of independent churches, especially now that become, as we see on the screen, uh, mega churches really don't tend to, to fellowship with other churches. They just wanna be within themselves, their own uh, network of churches and develop themselves from that standpoint. Bishop, can I kind of weigh back in on this before we leave that, that previous slide? Because I yes, have another sure. angle or another mm -hmm. perspective on this contrasting difference between non-denominational churches and interdenominational churches is non-denominational churches, you're absolutely correct. They are rejecting authority, they're rejecting hierarchy, they are rejecting placing themselves in a position of subordinacy. I have found that the usage of the term interdenominational is almost a marketing ploy. It is almost as though that congregation is saying, while, while a non-denominational non church is saying, we ain't none of that, an interdenominational church is saying, we're all of that. We're inclusive yeah. of that. And so it has been used almost as a marketing strategy to say that if you were Methodist, if you were Baptist, if you were Pentecostal, if you were Presbyterian, if you were Anglican, if you were Episcopalian, you are welcome here because us being an interdenominational church means that we recognize, honor, and celebrate all denominational traditions, whereas a non-denominational church would take the position that we are rejecting the characteristics of all of those denominations and we are self-enclosed. Interdenominational is trying to say to the seeker, to the potential yeah. believer, regardless of what you were before, you now can yet feel comfortable with that background, that history, that luggage in this place because we're all inclusive. Would you not agree, doctor? I agree, I agree. You're right on, Bishop. Um, someone needs to be muted and say, to talk about the noise that's in the background. If you haven't, if you got your mic up, and you shouldn't, we should, uh, we'll definitely uh, deal with that. 
we hear some noise. Yeah, we'll get we'll get to that. Um, I agree with that, uh, Bishop. You're right on. We'll go to the next section now. Politics. Politics should <laughs> not be something that divides a church. While some believers may be more comfortable yeah. with free discussion of politics from the pulpit, others may believe this is not appropriate. Now, let me say, as a pastor and as a preacher, this is something that I know I have struggled with or Dr. Goffin has struggled with, many of my colleagues and associates have struggled with, to what degree, how much of contemporary themes, subject matter, and topics ought we include in our preaching? Now, I believe it was Walter Rauschenbusch, that great theologian of um, yesteryear fame that said every pastor should go to the pulpit with a Bible in one hand and a copy of the New York Times in the other, which was his way of saying that there should be constant relevance and uh, contemporary effectiveness in all that we do in the vein of preaching and in the vein of worship. But there's a great deal of variety of thought in that particular in that particular regard. Doctor? Prior to 1954, um, when um, the political basis Congress and Senate met, there were chaplains, they had a great voice in politics, especially in this country. Whenever major disasters came about, you can check your history and read, they would call for a preacher to come to talk about um, what the Lord may be doing or saying. And uh, when we talk about, as we have now, a lot of things like hurricanes and uh, major events that was going on, floods, preachers were called in to give some perspective on what's going on. After 1954, and we had the uh, Tax Reform Act, and we start separating uh, politics from um, religion, we have this issue now with our uh, tax code, tax exemption code, that we would stay out of politics. And um, supposedly, they stay out of religion. So we have this uh, somewhat agreement. So as individuals, we can speak to uh, politics all we want, but as a body, as a church body, and as, a, as an entity, then we are restricted in our responses to uh, deal with that. That's sort of been how it is. So we walked a fine line for a long time and whether or not we should uh, use our pulpits, although politicians want to come to our pulpit to uh, solicit votes, but they don't want us to use our pulpits to influence people to vote. So it's, it's been a constant battle, especially in our democracy, to talk about where politics stand. But as Bishop Luther said, and I think the English uh, professor John Stott said the same thing, we need to have the Bible and a newspaper in our hand. And so right now, it almost seems we have to go with the Bible and have our RP turn to news and to the scripture as we uh, deal with some things that are developing there. Indeed, and if I could just further comment, uh, I so well remember 1984 and 1988, Jesse Lewis Jackson ran for president of the United States. Uh, this was a time when the relationship between church and state was somewhat relaxed, somewhat lenient. And I remember in 1984, uh, the obvious primary audience of Jesse Jackson was the church community. So as he campaigned, watch where I'm going now, as he campaigned mm -hmm. around the country, a lot of his fundraising came directly from churches. A lot of his rallies were held in churches and a lot of pastors uh, rallied and mobilized the resources of their churches to support the campaign of Jesse Jackson. Well, by 1988, when he ran that second time, when he would come to a local area, he then had to stipulate, you can't give me a check from your church. That is a violation of the separation of church and state. And it was far more rigid, far more enforcing that, uh, that monies that came from nonprofit organizations could not be used to fund a political campaign. And so we had to be creative and invent new ways to support Jesse Jackson in 1988 that we had not done in 1984. The same rules were on the book, or the same rules were on the books, but in terms of accountability and how it was being monitored, 
was altogether different. And of course, the success of Jesse Jackson brought a far more attention mm -hmm. to what churches were doing between 1984 and 1988 than it had done before. Doctor? Um, there's a question that asks, would this information be emailed? We are going to email you a copy of this video. It will be emailed to you. Uh, you'll have it within 24 hours. Uh, the video is being made available. Uh, we really would love for you to go to our, our website. I'll put it in the chat again and really um, really would uh, sign up for the course because we, we cover a lot of this material in the course. Uh, some of this is very germane to where we're going. But we're going to ask some pertinent questions where we just send some of the other courses that we're going to deal with. Uh, Bishop, let's, let's move beyond focuses in worshiping the God of the Bible. That should be ultimately where we get to. Yes. As a Christian denomination, our focus should be worshiping the God of the Bible. We're working towards the same goal of bringing Christ to the world. Our weekly services may look different, and we value different aspects of worship. However, with Christ as our center, we are all united. What I want to say about this, Doctor, is it seems to me that where we are ending up here in the 21st century is where the church started out in the first century, where there was this quest, this interest, this uh, pursuit of oneness, uh, the, uh, the Catholicity of the church, not in terms of it being Roman Catholic, but in terms of it being universal. So there was a desire in those first centuries to see the church as one. And I think what you're alluding to here is that there is an equally impressive desire here in the 21st century to see the church as one again. Doctor? I agree. I was reading a question and answer we have here uh, that is open, and I just want to summarize the last point of their statement because they reiterated what we mentioned earlier about having the newspaper and the Bible, but it says they believe that one should be careful concerning which way the event, politically speaking, the matter still needs to be vocalized. Some say a pastor should not involve themselves in politics. Your added thought. Well, we see even in scripture, you know, we have two big examples of, of both Joseph and Daniel who were involved heavily within the political atmosphere of their day. I think that we can see with the advent of, of Martin Luther King Jr. that we had here and others that sometimes there may be a, a sense of involving some things, especially when it affects our ethnic group and the things that are involved. So I think that uh, what we are saying in this statement here is that the focus of the church at the end of the day, regardless of all these branches that we deal with, is that Christ is our center. And we're all united around the fact that Jesus is Lord, that he is Lord and Savior. However, that can be assimilated in our weekly services and in the life of our churches. The major point here, and I want to become heavily uh, pious at this point in terms of looking at this viewpoint of making uh, Jesus the center of everything because God is the center and the centrality of throne has got to be emphasized in, in terms of pulling around so that we're, we stop the arguing over what we're fighting about style and everything else and get back to the point that we need to love the Lord with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might and with all our strength. Yes. And doctor, if I can just follow up on your piety and insert from a historical perspective that in 70 AD, because Judaism had, had moved too far in the vein and the direction of being political and representing a challenge to the political authority of Rome, they were destroyed. Uh, Titus, Vespasian came and literally destroyed Jerusalem. It wouldn't be until 125 AD that even the name Jerusalem or the word Jews could even be uttered again. It was the uh, intent of the Roman Empire to completely and utterly destroy Judaism. And Christianity was a part, was a resident in Jerusalem when this is taking place. I, I'm saying that to say that there was a conscious decision by the church because they had wandered too far into politics. It, it actually threatened their very survival. There was a conscious decision 
to become more pious, to seek piety, to spiritualize right. the church and to stay away from politics and stay away from authority so that it could survive and not be viewed as a threat or a rival to the temporal powers of this world. And that's when we begin to see this super spiritualization of Christianity almost to the point where it refused to address social issues, justice issues, political issues to any degree. Well, I think another point here, Bishop, is someone asked to me, if I misunderstood a little bit, why exclude non-denominational churches serving the same God? Uh, we're not excluding non-denominational churches. I think the non-denominational churches have excluded themselves. So I don't think it's a designation that we have put on them. It's a designation they have put on themselves. And I don't think that whether we have labels to our churches, and that may be where our issue is with all these labels to Christianity. So far, we have gotten so many labels on Christianity and things that we've done. We're all divided over our labor, labels. And so, as Paul mentioned, I, I convert to him back in 1 Corinthians 1, that can we all just speak the same thing? And if we take the centrality of the throne, as I mentioned, then we can all speak about Jesus Christ being Lord and Savior of our life. And we won't have to argue with the final points of Christianity that we do. All right. And here's my point. I think sure. it goes to my point here, Bishop, of what I'm talking about. So let's, 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 say, let's visit this one minute. Sure. We have forgotten what truly matters as we have allowed our focus to shift to our many differences. We have forgotten what truly matters. We must constantly remind ourselves to hold strong to things that are essential to our faith, allowing liberty in the non-essentials. Now, I'm gonna pause because I know that this is uh, uh, one of the strong suits of Dr. Goffin. I Let me just say as a preface, and, and, and uh, in anticipation of what he's gonna share with you, beloved, is that we have a culture and a society that has grown weary of labels. And yeah. people do no longer wanna be identified. Uh, even in the uh, uh, LGBTQ community, there's this now term called non-binary because there is a shrinking away from uh, employing labels to describe what we are. Well, in the church world, I think that has expression uh, in the tradition of those who say, I don't want to be Baptist, I don't want to be Presbyterian, I don't want to be Beth, uh, I don't want to be Methodist, I would just rather be non-denomination. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Goffin, let's talk about the essentials and the non-essentials. Yeah, and I think that's where we eventually hold ourselves true. There are things that we call in our theological position of the church, things that we must believe in order to be characterized as a Christian. What must a Christian believe? And the things that are considered non-essentials are, are things that are not pertinent to our salvation. We can all hear over final points. For instance, in eschatology, well, we believe wholeheartedly that there will be a producer. That's, that's one of the beliefs of our senses, we, our essentials. We believe that Christ will come again. So when we talk about the Godhead, we talked about the uh, spirit world, we talked about the property of man, and we talked about the whole nature of where God is in the world and in the study of last things. These five areas become what we call essentials. One must believe in these things in order to be a Christian. Now, again, when I talk about eschatology, when we talk about the uh, perusa or the coming or the epiphany of Christ appearing, we talk about that non-essentials. We start talking about whether that will be a, a pre, mid, or post-tribulational rapture or revelation. So we get into all of these gray areas of whether or not when it's going to happen and when it be. And that uh, Jesus said that no man will know the day or the hour when the Son of Man comes anyway. But we argue over these little fine points of how we want to get in our camp on what we want to call ourselves, what we call ourselves Calvinists or Arminianists. And so we, we, we put ourselves in these camps and these labels. And so we go back and forth. The essential is, do we believe in the virgin birth? Do we believe that Jesus Christ was both God and man? Do we believe 
in the spirit world. We believe that man has been deprived, that we're, we are not coming from a primitive to a modern man, but we have fallen from a mighty state, our spiritual state, and come back down. So we have fallen, man, and until Jesus enters history, we are all forgotten. I think we we have really forgotten what really matters. And someone mentioned that in, in the chat, in the Q&A, that sometimes we've forgotten what really matters. And that's, that's important. So we want to look at this, this and see what's going on so that we can see what's happening, what's essential is important. So we argue over fine points of theology and forget the essential areas. At the end, do you believe that Jesus Christ was really God, that he's fully God and fully man? Divinity added to itself humanity. And so the God man is now sitting in heaven waiting to come back in a mighty epiphany. Those are essential. However else you want to look at things, those are essential to our faith, to our preaching, to what we look at in our theology. And I don't want to get off here, but I can I can really get on the track. But uh, so, Doctor Little, yeah, uh, Doc Doctor Goffin, I have, and maybe it's indicative of my age, but I have lived long enough to see a shift and a move uh, when it comes to essentials and non-essentials. When I was a young man uh, growing up in a Baptocostal environment, uh, it was considered essential that women not wear earrings, not wear makeup, not wear pants. That was considered essential. I've lived long enough to see that be relabeled from essential to non-essential. And so there's no longer uh, the, the kind of rigidity in those same holiness slash Pentecostal circles about makeup, about pants, about attire. It has been moved and shifted from essential to non-essential. I think you're absolutely right. Once we are able to focus upon what are the essential items of our faith, then we don't have to divide ourselves over those things that are non-essential. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Um, and I think we can finally conclude this in this area. Here's a statement that's mentioned quite a bit. Sometimes this statement is attributed to Augustine, but it wasn't quite as far back as him. So we'll just mention it anyway. Sure. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. Let me say that again. In essentials, unity. What brings us together? Non-essentials, liberty. That's variety of thought, variety of practice. In all things, love. But it's important to hold ourselves and other religions accountable for those things which are essential to our faith. However, there are many things that are non-essential. When we approaching non-essential differences between Christian denominations, we must consider whether something is simply not our preference or if it is unbiblical. And that goes all the way back to baptism, the mode of baptism, how we baptize. And I know we have about 10 minutes left and we want to leave time for Q&A. And so I'll stop there, Doctor. Uh, you, you're, you're right. We probably hit a can of worms here, Bishop, but I wanted to put this up anyway. In essentials, unity and non-essentials, liberty and in all things love. Uh, someone asks this question, what does a post-denominational church look like in a post-pandemic world, especially since there is a move away from conventional labels? Well, I, I think, as I mentioned last night on something called an emergent church, just not even without that label, there is something new that's emerging out of what we see from the flame. There's something happening within the church. And I think there is there is a, a lot of things getting ready to come about that we don't we don't know what's going on and how it's going to happen. But I think um, we're going to see some interesting things happening in the next few years in the changing shift of the church. When I teach on ecclesiology, one of the things I point out is the church in the past, the church in the present, and the church in the future. So we have to really look at the viewpoint of all that. It is always the church in the present that finds itself either looking back or looking forward as to determine where they are now. Um, here, uh, someone else says, I have been taught this is denominational, nor will I ever teach this, but will seek the fellowship of all. And I, and I think that's, um, that becomes opinionated in terms of where everybody is. They, um, whatever this is that we see, we see the essential, and we want to get these essentials as a part of who we are and where we are. Um, we're going to leave it open a little bit now so that uh, if any of you have any questions or comments you want to make, we want to really point out, and I just put in the, in the um, chat section again, 
the link to this course, this two-part course. You'll save $50 if you go to that link and sign up for it now. We have other courses too that are on that particular site. And then we have classes on the um, Graduate School of Episcopal Studies, um, episcopalschool.teachable.com. So we want you, we're gonna do more of these. We need to hear from you. And your uh, response email that you get you get our email address, you can write to us, you wanna see us do more of these kind of things like this, as promised to the coursework that we are developing. Um, Dr. Luda. Let me just uh, spend a moment or two encouraging you to not only review and take a look at what we have put together, an awesome amount of time and attention and energy has been put into making sure that you have a superb educational experience. We have taken the, assemb the assembled and the uh, collective experiences that we have gathered over the years in a variety of institutions that we have either been taught at or that we have taught uh, to give you a first, our first uh, class educational experience here in the area of theology. And I'm not saying this because it does, but I don't think that you can find a finer opportunity to access and expose yourself to theological thought and the more and the and the in-depth uh, illuminating subject matters of theology than uh, what we have available at Theology Online. And for those of you who are candidates for the Episcopal CA and are being elevated, our Graduate School of Episcopal Studies we believe is one of the finest institutions that's available to prepare you and equip you and to, and to tutor you on uh, what it means to be a bishop, especially here in the 21st century. There in our Graduate School of Episcopal Studies, one of the newest courses, and, I, and I, I just have to go here, one of the newer courses that we have is a course entitled The Future of the Episcopacy. What we're arguing here is that the bishop of old, the bishopric, I don't want to deal with personality. I want to deal with office. The office of the bishop, as it has been practiced and exercised in the past, we will find that it's being exercised and practiced quite differently in the 21st century than it was, say, in the 19th century or the 18th century. And even, and we talked about this not too long ago, Dr. Garfin, about uh, the leniency and the laxity that comes with dress and that. Uh, the allegiance to civic attire or cleric attire does not seem to be as keen now as it has been in the past. Well, there is a Vesta Arian, 1550, a Vesta Arian controversy that took place between the reign of King Henry VI and Elizabeth I. And what we're doing, the conversations and this going back and forth as to whether we wear collars or not wear collars, do we wear robes or not wear robes? That is a recycled expression of the Vesta of the Vesta Arian controversy of 1550. Doctor. Right. And also you, we had to uh, invest your controversy again within the Anglican Church in the 1800s that, that led to a 30-year war between the, um, the, the church in England. Um, Deborah Wallace wants to speak. She's on the phone. I'm going to allow her to talk. You raise her hand. You're, you're now, your phone is now open to talk. Sister Wallace. Oops. Good evening, Sister Wallace. Yes. It's one of my students. Yes. That's one of your students, okay. Yes. Yes, she's asking to unmute. She had her hand up. You, I think you can speak. You have to unmute yourself. Sister Wallace, we're allowing you to speak if you want to speak. Yes, I thought she'd come in. Well, her, her mic is still muted. She has to unmute her own mic. Okay. Yes, I'm just That's enjoying it. the seminar and uh, it raised its hand on its own. So it's an error, <laughs> but I can hear you guys well. Okay, great. And we have some of the comments over here thanking us. Uh, we're Donna practitioners and scholars. We thank God for your comments. Uh, thank you all for, for, for being on. We have a number of people on tonight. We have more tonight than we had on last night. Yes, um, yes. And those of you who have signed up for the night before, we signed up on the night before, 
you also would have gotten that in your email. If not, you weren't signed on tonight, last night, but you signed on tonight, you can go to our YouTube channel, Episcopal Studies, and this video will be posted on our YouTube channel. Those you are registered, you'll get a copy of it in your email, but it will also be on our YouTube channel uh, under Episcopal Studies. Subscribe to our channel. We're going to be putting more works up there, more um, sessions that we have, and also be giving you promise for the school. Um, we love to give back. That's why we set up this, this session. It's not all to, always about paid courses all the time. We want to share this information, but we want to whet your appetite that you come in with us. Uh, Bishop Lou and I have been partnering for quite some time now, around 20 some years we've been, we've been partnering uh, together. And so we, we've co-teach as well as teach separately. And it's been a wonderful experience in um, dealing with a, a friend and a colleague that we share these sessions together and combine our scholarship together on the things that we're doing. So thank you for your participation. Thank you for coming uh, this evening and being a part. Um, thank you for uh, these sessions. Um, yeah, there's a place of politics. I believe someone is putting information out here in the Q&A, Bishop. Are you reading it? I believe it should be over power the message of God. I appreciate your insight in this problem of the church. Thank you. Um, we try. We try. There are various opinions on politics and the gospel. And so this whole issue of social justice has been and the systemic racism has been a hot button within the church. And it goes on and on. The only problem is once you start pulling the engine and you start putting the cars up to it, the passenger cars, other things come behind. Uh, in the political arena, sometimes to get bills passed, you got to have all these other things on attached to it. So we have a lot of things attached to some of the things we want to get. Uh, this bill's attached, this amendment attached. This is not going through. Nothing goes through in politics on one issue. There are going to be riders that's going to be put on that. So if you're going to get this passed, a lot of other things got to be carried on as baggage. And so we see that a lot in our political arena. But let's pray. Let's pray. Uh, as Paul said, in our uh, second Timothy 2, he said that we got to pray for everyone, those in authority and, and everyone that we pray. A prayer is still the, the choice and the weapon we can do without sounding too pious. I know we, we have these two issues of piety and protest. Some people feel that we should be just protesting. Others feel we should pray. We can pray and protest, but uh, in terms of being on the body point, the effect of the fervent prayer of the righteous man prevail of much. Well, friends, that takes up just about all of our time, and we certainly want to thank you for yours. Listen, I'm Andy C. Luda. This is Dr. Dennis Goffin. Mm -hmm. If you haven't already done so, go take a look at that link that we have in the chat room. We have worked very, very hard putting together a number of courses that we want you to consider that we'd like you to take. Each of our courses, uh, there are class reviews, and so there will be time for you to have sessions with us almost individually to uh, make sure that you're comprehending the material and that you're digesting what we have made available to you. We have a special bundle that's going on right now that we want you to take advantage of. Uh, it is denominations one, denominations two. Uh, they normally sell for $99 a piece, but we put them together giving you a deep discount because we want you to take advantage of what the Lord has blessed us with. Until next time, I'm Andy Saluda. Of course, this is Dr. Goffin. We're going to give him the last word. But go in peace, go in joy, go in love, go in happiness, because the author of the same goes with you, Dr. Goffin. Thank you, Dr. Lula. And we're just going to say thank you for your time tonight. And we hope you take advantage of these courses and other courses we're going to do in the future. Good night to everyone. And may the Lord bless you all. <laughs>